Capital Investment Committee will come to order. I know we have a long list of testifiers. I'm really excited to see a full room of people enthusiastic about a bonding bill. So um, I think we've asked you to please limit your comments to two minutes. Wait, I'm going to get my timer out. Are you going to do it? Oh, okay. Yeah, Ms. Carlson's going to do it. This is something I learned from Representative Kaylee Herr. I guess it's common in the House. Um, and so we have a list here, and then if there's uh, certainly any time at the end, if somebody didn't sign up, we'll certainly open it up to you. And I'll just call people ahead so you can come and join the table. And we're starting out with Commissioner Jim Showalter, Assistant Commissioner Bob Meyer, and uh, from, from M MDVA, Ben Johnson. And we will have some people joining us on Zoom as well. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Commissioner, and welcome to the Capital Investment Committee. Thank you very much. For the record, my name is Jim Showalter, Commissioner of Minnesota Management and Budget, and uh, I'm happy to uh, sort of lead off uh, state agencies' uh, testimony about some key projects that are in this bill. I just want to start by uh, pointing out this. This is just a great beginning uh, to accomplishing capital investment in this session. Uh, I'd like to thank you, uh, Chair Pappas, for convening and pushing this forward and, and, and working with the administration on priorities. As we saw in the 2022 bonding project, uh, you know, the in need for infrastructure is just very high. You know, we know that there's billions of dollars of potential and very worthy projects that are out there. And, 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 and by delaying, they just start to cost more. Um, while it's a hectic time frame for everyone to push this bill forward at this time, I appreciate that urgency as well. Uh, you know, unlike you know, expensive wine or cheese, these projects aren't getting better with time. Well, what they're doing is they're getting more expensive and more out of date. The plans for these projects were put together almost two years ago. And so the bottom line is pushing these forward and making sure that we have the ability to control as much of the inflation as we can and the project costs and plans as we can is great. Um, I also just appreciate, Chair, the, the work at in adding asset preservation to this bill. Um, you know, this is a, a, an improved mark from where the discussions were last year, and it's an ongoing need, and certainly uh, the capital assets across the state uh, need that attention. So again, we appreciate uh, the number of governor's priorities that you've worked with us to get into this measure, uh, and we just thank the committee for your partnership and uh, a review of this bill. Thank you very much, Senator, uh, Mr. Commissioner Showalter, Senator Showalter. Um, our time is pretty limited, so um, if members have short questions, we certainly can take them, but I'd like to move as quickly as possible. Thank you, Commissioner. Next, um, uh, Assistant Commissioner Meyer. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. For the record, Bob Meyer, Assistant Commissioner, Department of Natural Resources, and thank you for the opportunity to be here today. We're pleased to see, as Mr. As Commissioner Showalter said, early progress on a bonding bill. As you know, as you've heard pre previously in our earlier presentation of the committee, DNR has a large and diverse portfolio of ass capital assets that need attention. The bill in front of you contains investments in some important areas, including Waterville Fish Hatchery, Bedora State Forest Nursery, Wildfire Aviation and Structure at Hibbing, and the continued development of Lake Vermilion Sudan Underground Mine State Park. And the bill does not cover the full scope and scale of the DNR's needs, as you know, with our capital asset report that we presented to you. It follows the practice of taking care of only the most urgent, critical needs and does not include transformative investments, such as our Get Out More proposal that we spoke to you about earlier. Finally, we are pleased to see the community tree planting program included, but I wanted to make sure the committee understands the funding limitations with bond funds for that program. We also have a general fund appropriation as well, but bond funds, as you know, can only be limited to certain activities, which may restrict the, the fundability for some local communities. We will work through those issues with you into the future, and thank you for your support. Thank you very much, and I did forget to mention to ask you to please repeat your name and your title. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Meyer. Next, uh, Mr. Johnson. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Pappas, Senator Housley, Vice Chair Paw, and members. Uh, my name is Benjamin Johnson. I'm the Legislative Director for the Minnesota Department of Veterans Affairs. Commissioner Herkey asked me to inform you that he's recovering from an illness and sends his regrets that he can't be here today. Uh, thank you for the inclusion of funding for agency asset preservation needs and a significant and long overdue investment in a campus-wide refurbishment at the Minnesota Veterans Homes Hastings and our domiciliary program. 
77.77 million reflects the state share, about 35% for pre-design, design, demolition, and construction of replacement administrative and residential infrastructure at the campus. This commitment would put the state in a strong position to secure the, the federal match of approximately $144 million, which is 65% of the modernization project cost. Veterans domiciliary care is distinct from the more traditional long-term care offered at our other veterans' homes. DOM's program offers mental, chemical, and medical support for veterans who require less than a skilled level of care. We've operated the Hastings campus for 45 years, but the history of that location stretches back to 1902. It's a 120 acre site that previously housed the asylum for the hopelessly insane. It's a little bit different uh, clientele that we serve now. On four different occasions since 1980, we've undertaken renovations, but the last of this nature was in 2008. Uh, the plan is to demolition, dem demolish five buildings and replace them with one building which consolidates veterans housing, services, and support spaces. Primarily, this would allow all veteran residents to have access to the same level of care and would offer them private rooms and private bathrooms. Um, in the interest of time, I will, I will simply note that I've off, uh, offered a copy of a, a handout that includes m more specific details on this project, but I want to thank you for the inclusion of this. Uh, I'd also like to highlight that the inclusion of 12.3 in asset preservation is a significant need as well and will help us with uh, improvements and betterments of a capital nature at the agency. Again, thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Um, I'd like to invite up now Ms. Kahn, uh, Executive Director Kerr, and Commissioner Daubenberger. And as they're coming up, the next group will be Ms. Donahue, uh, Mr. Kane, and Ms. Nauman. Assistant Commissioner Khan. Good afternoon, Chair and members of the committee. My name is Sophia Khan, and I'm an Assistant Commissioner and Chief of Staff for the Minnesota Department of Corrections. I'm here today to express our gratitude for the significant and much needed asset preservation funds that are included in this bill. As you know, DOC prisons are a 24-7 operation for almost 4,300 DOC staff who serve Minnesotans every day. We also have over 8,000 individuals living in our facilities on any given day. As you know, some of our facilities are over 130 years old. The investment in asset preservation funds for the DOC will allow us to take care of projects that impact the safety of those working and living in our facilities. I know the commissioner was before you recently, and I also want to highlight the unique nature of our asset preservation request in that we do need non bondable components for security and safety that require cash. In addition, in order to carry out our mission of transforming lives for a safer Minnesota, we also have a critical need for more programming space at our Fairbowl, Lino Lakes, and Shakopee facilities to ensure we can provide things like treatment, adult basic and higher education, and religious and spiritual programming. As always, we are happy to work with you, Chair, and members of the committee on this moving forward. Again, thank you so much for your support for our requests. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Kerr. Madam Chair, members of the committee, thank you. Uh, for the record, my name is Don Kerr, the Executive Director of the Department of Military Affairs. I'm here on behalf of Major General Sean Mankey, the Adjutant General, who's returning from Norway right now. Uh, had a very successful visit over there, so he, he'll be back with us shortly. Uh, I want to thank the committee on his behalf for the support of our initiatives. Uh, very important programs to maintain uh, our program of, of keeping our facilities in line and uh, doing that in a, in a relatively uh, logical manner. I did want to add my thanks for moving this project forward. As Commissioner Showalter mentioned earlier, the timing does matter on this. Uh, we have been working on these projects. All of them are currently in progress. And we've actually had to take money out of our maintenance appropriation to keep these things moving. And for the Marshall project, which we have not yet initiated, uh, having the legislative authority when the governor signs the bill is what allows us to move forward with the federal government to arrange the financing on their end. And so the sooner that that happens, the more competitive we are at the national level. So it is very important that this bill move as quickly as it is. And we wanted to thank the committee for that. And uh, with that, Madam Chair, thank you very much again. And, uh, thank you so much, uh, Director Kerr. And uh, Ms. Daubenberger, and next will be Margaret Donahue. I think I mentioned the next group. Okay, Commissioner Daubenberger. Thank you, Madam Chair and committee members. My name is Nancy Daubenberger, and I'm the Commissioner for the Minnesota Department of Transportation. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today on the Capital Investment Bill. We sincerely appreciate your inclusion of funding for so many transportation projects. 
The local road and bridge funding will provide critical resources for the county, city, and township transportation networks. Minnesota has the fourth largest roadway network in the nation, and most of the system is operated and maintained by local governments. Funding for rail grade crossing replacements and the significant amount of funding provided for the Minnesota Rail Service Improvement Program will help support investments on over 4,400 miles of railroad tracks. The over 18 million provided for public ports would be the largest investment ever in the Port Development Assistance Program. Also, thank you for including funding for Safe Routes to School, the Active Transportation Program, and Greater Minnesota Transit. These programs all help us achieve our vision of having a multimodal transportation system that maximizes the health of people, the environment, and our economy. Madam Chair, MnDOT recognizes that this bill does not include any trunk highway bonding, and I look forward to working with you and Chairs Dibble and Hornstein so that we can make sure to address those needs in future legislation. Likewise, we look forward to working with you to secure funding for the Northern Lights Express passenger rail project between Duluth and Minneapolis. Again, thank you for your work on securing funding for these critical transportation projects and programs. Thank you very much, Commissioner. I appreciate you being here today. Uh, so next, as I mentioned, Ms. Donahue, Mr. Kane, and Ms. Nauman. And then the next um, group will be Mr. Swanson, Ms. Strong, and Mr. Kelleher. Ms. Donahue. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Margaret Donahoe. I'm the Executive Director of the Minnesota Transportation Alliance. Um, on behalf of the members of the Transportation Alliance, I would like to thank uh, Senator Pappas and the committee for moving quickly to develop a capital investment proposal with substantial funding for transportation infrastructure projects in Minnesota that will create well-paying careers and enhance our economy. The design and construction industries are ready to get to work, and with this level of funding or higher, uh, we can deliver on projects that are waiting to be built that will improve the lives of Minnesotans. It's time to catch up and keep up with robust capital investment bills every year that allow the state and local governments to maintain and improve critical public infrastructure. We face a growing backlog of deficient local bridges, deteriorating roads, as well as transit projects that will improve mobility for thousands of Minnesotans waiting for funding. The local road and local bridge programs have become critical programs every year for counties, cities, and townships as they struggle to maintain the large number of roadways and bridges under their jurisdiction. We also support the funding for port and waterway projects investments in rail, in addition to funding for the Local Road Wetland Replacement Program. Uh, we greatly appreciate the support for funding arterial bus rapid transit to build out the system in the metropolitan area, as well as important transit facility needs in greater Minnesota. The Federal Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act will make a difference, but it does not represent a windfall that will meet all of our needs. We still need a strong level of state funding, and the money for transportation projects in this bill can also be used as matching funds in order to access increased federal dollars. Thank you for recognizing the need to improve the safety and effectiveness of the transportation system that all Minnesotans rely on every day. Thank you very much, Ms. Donahoe. Now, um, Mr. Kane. Chair Pappas, a member of the committee, thank you for giving me the time to speak. I'm Ray Kane, Department of Minnesota American Legion Service Officer for the state of Minnesota. Organizations represent veterans, their families, and the communities across the state and nation. The American Legion stems from the nation of veterans helping fellow veterans. For decades, we've helped others from programs that get veterans involved in their communities to the GI Bill itself. We help start the VA as well, and we maintain relationships with government agencies, state and federal, that care for veterans across the nation. We are involved in the passing of legislation from the PACT Act to the federal level and the Veterans Restorative Justice Act at the state level. We care. The American Legion Department of Minnesota Veterans Rehab staff members, like me, 
regularly visit Minnesota veterans homes to ensure the care of our veterans and to ensure the state is upholding their end of the bargain. That is why I'm here today. I'm asking you to include the campus upgrade for the veterans Hastings home and the bonding bill. Minnesotans have waited long enough for this bonding bill to pass so that the state can provide its share to release federal matching funds. The American Legion favors the Minnesota Department of Veterans Affairs to replace the six buildings of the nine buildings on the campus so that Minnesotans can better serve our 141 veterans in the Minnesota Department of Veterans Affairs domiciliary program. Rest assured, the funding that will be well received in both the home districts. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Kane. Um, thank you for your service. And Ms. Nauman. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. My name is Patricia Nauman. I'm the Executive Director of Metro Cities, representing the shared interests of cities across the metropolitan area in front of the legislature. Uh, Metro Cities does appreciate the inclusion of $12 million for assistance to metropolitan cities for efforts to address inflow infiltration or clean water that ends up um, uh, seeping into local public sewer infrastructure. Cities in the metropolitan area are compelled to address excess levels of what we call INI or inflow and infiltration to ensure that the INI does not end up flowing um, from local pipes into the regional wastewater system where it is treated unnecessarily and uses capacity that is intended for the treatment of actual wastewater. Cities are working to address these fixes on their local infrastructure at the local level, which is the actual, the most cost effective way to achieve mitigation, but nevertheless, the fixes are costly for local governments. These funds are important to these efforts and will be put to good use to address this work on local basic infrastructure. So I appreciate your time, Madam Chair members. Thank you very much. Now we have Mr. Swanson, Ms. Strong, and Mr. Kelleher coming up. And then next will be Elizabeth Hoffman on Zoom, uh, Mark McCabe, and uh, Trist, uh, Commissioner Mastacasio also. Is she in person or on Zoom? In person, in person. okay. Um, welcome, uh, Mr. Swanson. Good afternoon, Chair Pappas and members of the committee. My name is Brian Swanson, and I'm here on behalf of the University of Minnesota to speak in favor of the proposed capital investment bill. Thank you for including full funding in the bill for the undergraduate chemistry teaching facility on the Twin Cities campus. This project is shovel ready and we look forward to welcoming into this new facility the thousands of students from programs across the university who take chemistry every semester. These new teaching labs will make an enormous difference for these students and for the businesses here in Minnesota, Minnesota that hire our talented graduates. We appreciate as well the proposed 39.5 million of HEPA in the bill and we will use these funds to make critical improvements across the university system. We can and will spend every dollar of it wisely and quickly. Your past HEPR investments have made an incredible difference on our campuses and research centers across the state. The amount in the proposed bill, however, leaves over 100 critical HEPR projects unfunded. We are hopeful that there will be an additional opportunity for capital funding this session. We support additional funding this session so that we can complete more of the projects on our $200 million HEPR list, as well as the other specific projects on our request. Our $200 million HEPR request is what we need as a minimum investment every year to keep our facilities in the condition they're in. We look forward to working with you as we seek full funding on these important projects. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Swanson. Ms. Strong. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members. My name is Sarah Strong. I'm here on behalf of the 2,300 members of the American Institute of Architects, Minnesota, to express their support for both Senate Files 676 and 677. Minnesota's architects, along with their partners in the construction industry, have long advocated for regular and robust capital investment bills that support projects in all phases of development, from planning and pre-design to those ready to begin construction. That regularity has too often been interrupted in recent years, making swift movement on these proposals that much more important. These bills will help address the significant backlog of deferred maintenance that is reducing the value and functionality of our public buildings. They also invest in our local communities, including and especially communities of color that have historically suffered from underinvestment. While the investments made through state bonding are just a percentage of the total dollars spent on designing construction in Minnesota, they are absolutely critical to help keep the construction cycle running smoothly by helping to maintain a steady stream of work. 
We should not wait any longer to make these investments in our communities. The needs will only grow and the projects will only become more expensive. Funding bonding projects across the state will have the added benefit of helping the AEC industry at a critical time. Designers, engineers, contractors, and laborers are prepared to put these investments to work today. AIA Minnesota is heartened to see the early movement on bonding this session. We'd like to thank you, Madam Chair, and the committee for your leadership on this, and we ask you to please pass these bills as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kelleher. I thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. For the record, I'm David Kelleher, Director of Public Policy for the Minnesota Historical Society. We would like to thank you for the support for Historic Sites Asset Preservation and the County and Local Historic Preservation Grants Program provided in this bill. Funding provided will help to preserve some of Minnesota's most historically significant buildings and structures for the education and enjoyment of our visitors now and in future generations. We do have much more work to do ahead of us, however. As we discussed with the committee last week, we have tens of millions of dollars worth of unmet needs for asset preservation for historic structures in the statutorily defined historic sites network, a state responsibility. As funding for these important projects is delayed, they only get more expensive and complicated due to advanced deterioration and increased costs. As these bills advance, and in a potential second capital investment bill this year, and in a bonding bill in the 24th session, we would appreciate your support for additional historic sites asset preservation funding. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kelleher. Now we have someone joining us online, Elizabeth Hoffman. Elizabeth, um, who is the director of the Plum Creek Library System. Welcome to the committee, Ms. Hoffman. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Elizabeth Hoffman, and I'm the director of the Plum Creek Library System. I'm here representing public libraries throughout the state, and I'd like to thank the committee for your support of the library capital improvement projects. With over 350 public library locations in Minnesota and a network of shared resources, every person in the state has access to a library. The average age of a public library building in the state is 53 years, and those historic buildings require maintenance to continue to meet the needs of the public. Over $90 million in renovations and construction projects have been identified across the state, and I'd like to provide some examples that I'm familiar with. In Redwood Falls, they've outgrown their current building. The meeting space they have available is not large enough to hold many of the programs the libraries would like to host. There has been a great deal of support from the community to expand the library, and they're currently working to find funding for their $3 million project. In Tyler, Minnesota, there's no meeting room. However, adding a meeting room isn't a priority. They're looking for funding to repair the roof. There are currently garden hoses redirecting the water that leaks into the building. One of the leaks is over the only place that can house the public computers. There are other building needs in the Plum Creek region and all of Minnesota's library regions. New buildings in Moorhead, an accessible entrance in New Ulm, new windows in Sauk County, and those are just a few of the many examples of capital improvement needs of the aging libraries of Minnesota. Thank you again for your support. Thank you so much, Ms. Hoffman, and um, as hopefully you heard before that uh, the library construction line is really $4 million, and it sounds like you have a greater need, so we certainly, we, we have you, I believe, scheduled to come in and talk to us later this session uh, in greater depth. But thank you for joining us today. Um, Mr. McCabe. Hey, Madam Chair, committee members, my name is Mark McCabe, and I'm here representing the 10 uh, park agency of the, agencies of the metropolitan area. The metropolitan regional park system functions as the state park system of the metro area. A bonding program uh, is fundamental to taking care of this regional park system. So I'm here speaking in support of these bills. An appropriation would provide critical funding to the regional parks program to help support the capital needs of our 10 regional park implementing agencies that own and operate this park system. These funds can be leveraged as the Met Council's policy is to provide a $2 match for every $3 of state funds. Uh, the system is comprised of over 54,000 acres, and in 2021, our regional parks and trails system had over 65 million visits. So you can imagine this staggering use puts quite a strain and wear and tear on our system. So these funds are, are critical. We need 
regular and significant state funding to support the system to ensure that we'll be able to continue to provide a high quality uh, program and opportunities for all. And finally, um, this uh, funding would go to support our highest priority projects as determined by the implementing agencies, elected boards, and commissions. Thank you for your time and for your support of these bills. Great. You thank you so much for your testimony. And Commissioner Mastas Castillo. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. I'm Trista Mattis Castillo, Chair of the Ramsey County Board of Commissioners. I want to first of all thank you for including two of Ramsey County's bonding priorities uh, in this bill. The first, the, Bruce, the continuation of the Bruce Vento Trail and a significant down payment for uh, the park at River's Edge. I'd like to lift up and talk a little bit more about the park at River's Edge. We have a $26 million ask for the park. This is the most important project in, the, in both Ramsey County, but also supports the work of the City of St. Paul. You hear, hear the support from our downtown business council, our downtown residents, uh, as well as the mayor of St. Paul in this project. It really is the thing that will activate our most important asset in Minnesota, and that's the Mississippi River. The park at River's Edge promises to keep the access to the river to our residents first, while later we can develop and build a tax base. One of the things that Ramsey County doesn't have is a big tax base because, quite frankly, there's a lot of government buildings, nonprofits, hospitals, and universities in Ramsey County. And being the smallest land mass county with the second highest population, we have more poverty than any other county in the state of Minnesota. So it's really important for us to develop a tax base. The park at River's Edge will take four acres of land and turn it into nine acres of land uh, and develop that. We estimate it will bring in an additional $15 million of of tax revenue a year. That's five million for the school districts, five million for the city, and five million for the county. A critical need to make sure that we have access. It will also improve the, the um, climate resiliency and our flooding issues of the river itself. So we're gonna be able to mitigate some of the environmental risks provide access to the river, equitable access, and activate a space for community events, for cultural events, and small business owners that we've already invested in. So this is an incredibly important project for us in Ramsey County and for our city and for our entire state. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us, uh, Commissioner. Um, next, we have on Zoom, uh, former Senator and Commissioner Sheila Kiskaden. And uh, we also will have Mr. George on Zoom. And then we'd like to invite former Commissioner Margaret Anderson Kelleher, Sean Kershaw, and Mary McCummer to the, um, to the witness stand here. And going back to Commissioner Kiskaden. I think I'm seeing Nate George. What happened to Commissioner Kiskaden? Commissioner Kiskaden? Okay, while we're trying to figure out what happened to her, let's go then to Mr. George. Mr. George, Mayor George. Hello, and thank you, Chair Pappas, Ranking Republican Lead Housley, and committee members. My name is Nate George. I am the Mayor of Bram. Uh, Bram residents will shoulder a massive fiscal burden with 2023 tax bonuses about to come out, showing a 43% <laughs> property tax hike, due in large part to numerous unplanned emergency water system repair costs that depleted our general fund last year. We've already had two major water main breaks in less than a month this year. Not terribly unusual given the 90 plus year age of most of our water and sewer infrastructure. We're a city of 1800 and more than a quarter of our families are at poverty level or lower. We are grateful to finally see some of the state matching funds going towards PFA and lead service lines that will benefit our community greatly. We are also hoping that you provide our city with surplus general fund dollars in this bill or later this year. We're asking 9.19 million in bonding in conjunction with the 3.5 million dollars to general fund allocation for an immediate first phase start to upgrade the failing infrastructure. Those costs, which just went up 2.5 million last month due to new MPCA design requirements. Lastly, we appreciate the opportunity to testify in front of you today and uh, share the extent of our, of our situation. We really hope that the needs-based formula that is currently in place for these types of funding remains intact. It is the fairest, most equitable solution for cities of all sizes and that have varying needs. Thank you for your time and I'm available for any questions. Thank you, Mr. George. Unfortunately, your story is uh, not unusual in small towns throughout Minnesota. 
Thank you for joining us today. Um, I believe we have uh, Commissioner Cascaden with us now. Uh, Commissioner. Madam Chair, I'm sorry. I would, I'm having trouble with a technical problem. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you and see you. Apologies for not being with you in person. I managed after three years to come down with COVID a couple of days ago, so I'm not exposing you, but very pleased that we have this technology so that I can be with you electronically. I want to thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee for including the materials recovery facility that uh, Olmsted County has proposed in the delete all amendment to Senate file 676. Um, our materials recovery facility is going to be, be strongly supported uh, and very much needed within Southeast Minnesota. We do not have a materials recovery facility, uh, despite the fact that we have very, uh, you know, the karst topography that makes uh, protecting the groundwater ever more important. Uh, so we are managing currently municipal waste for Dodge and Olmsted County, and that of course includes the third largest city, the city of Rochester. And we know that additional counties and organizations in the Southeast Minnesota region have already provided letters of support and are interested in utilizing a materials recovery facility once it is operational. What we will be able to do with this materials recovery facility is remove from the midst of solid waste uh, things that can be recycled um, and um, we can improve our overall recycling rates, although we're actively working in that area, but having the materials recovery facility, we'll be able to move the processing up the waste hierarchy. We'll be able to process those materials locally. That will reduce the need for hauling and it will reduce the need for uh, use of our waste energy facility and landfill, which is uh, which avoids future investment and expansion of those facilities, which are also environmentally sensitive. So we very much appreciate the $10 million that you have included in, in your bonding bill for the materials recovery facility. I do have to note that were you able to uh, include 16 million more, that would be 50% of the cost of the facility. We are happy to have 10 million, don't misunderstand me, and we will be, uh, be moving ahead. We also really strongly support the local road improvement program the local bridge replacement program, the local wetlands replacement investments and housing that you've included in this bill. All of these things touch Olmsted County and we are pleased to see them in the bill. Uh, we appreciate your early action on the bill and we look forward to working with you on this materials recovery facility proposal and the other, uh, other projects that our, our uh, county and our communities have advanced. So thank you, Madam Chair, for the time to be with you today and thank you for making this technology option available. Very much appreciate it. Thank you so much for joining us from Rochester, um, Commissioner, and I hope that your symptoms are mild. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I see that Director Kelleher, Anderson Kelleher, cannot join us. Is this Ms. Topinka? Yes, All thank right. you. Uh, Proceed. Madam Chair and committee members, my name is Katie Topinka. I'm the Director of Intergovernmental Relations for the City of Minneapolis. And um, passing on regrets from Director, uh, Public Works Director uh, Margaret Anderson Kelleher, who uh, was caught up in a meeting at City Hall. Um, but we want to um, thank you for including the City of Minneapolis Central Stormwater Tunnel um, in the DE amendment for Senate File 670. Um, this tunnel was originally built in the 1930s. It consists of four miles of deep stormwater drainage and underlays the most densely developed part of Minneapolis downtown. Uh, funding for the Central City Tunnel will increase the capacity of this vital piece of downtown Minneapolis infrastructure. It was designed and constructed to handle precipitation runoff um, from 90 years ago. And so we've seen changes in that time. Um, land development and an increase in storm frequency and intensity have directed significantly more stormwater to the tunnel and pressurized the system which degrades the tunnel condition and increases the risk of collapse. So the $9.9 million uh, in this bill, um, which is out of a total of a $57 million project, will go toward increasing the capacity to reduce risks of tunnel failure, which would lead to economic loss. Uh, it will also reduce tunnel repair costs and address challenges like surface flooding. 
So we are glad this proposal is included in this package and we look forward to continuing to work with you throughout session on the city's other bonding priorities for key infrastructure projects, which include things like the Nicolette Avenue Bridge and emergency operations training facility for, for the fire department. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Topinka. And Mr. Kershaw. Thank you, Chair Pappas and committee members. My name is Sean Kershaw and I'm the Public Works Director for the City of St. Paul. I'm here today to testify in support of Senate file, which includes funding for our Third Street Kellogg Boulevard Bridge. Many of you on this committee previously supported our 2020 appropriation to reconstruct this bridge, and for that, we are deeply grateful. I wanna note that at the time of our original award, our bridge was at 60% design. Like all of us in this room, we did not anticipate the pandemic and the subsequent inflation increases nationwide, particularly on bridge materials, which have increased at a substantially higher rate than inflation, and you've heard about that from others today. By the time our project hit 90% design, we noticed a large gap due solely to material cost increases. There have been no scope changes in this project. The Third Street Kellogg Bridge is the longest city-owned bridge in St. Paul and has numerous structural deficiencies. It was built originally under a MnDOT contract in the 1980s and turned back to the city. We have lane restricted this bridge since 2014 due to structural flaws in the outer parts of the bridge deck. The forthcoming gold line will take advantage of our reconstructed bridge and will connect St. Paul to the cities of Maplewood, Landfall, Oakdale, and Woodbury. With complete funding, we will be able to fully restore traffic lanes, accommodate multimodal transportation, and improve safety by upgrading intersections, dedicating turn lanes, and creating wider trails and sidewalks for residents. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Director Kershaw. And I was on that bridge the other night, so it's safe enough to be on the bridge. <laughs> it's not going to collapse underneath us. As long as you're on the parts that aren't restricted. Yes, I was. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Ms. McComber. Uh, Madam Chair and committee members, I'm Mary McComber. I'm the mayor of Oak Park Heights. And I'm here to thank you today for including the grant for Oak Park Heights in this bill. Um, many of you were at the tour at our city about two years ago now, and um, we're able to see what we're asking for. Um, the city is the host to the Allen S. King plant, coal fire plant, which is going to be um, retired shortly. Um, it contributes 32% of our tax base to our city, um, which we will be losing. Um, what we're asking for is in future uh, trying to plan for redevelopment of that site to try and recapture our, our tax base. We're asking for the infrastructure to get into the site, which would be the city water, sewer, storm sewer, roads, um, trails, sidewalks. Um, I appreciate your consideration of this bill, and I thank Senator Housley. She's um, been very supportive of our city and um, in this project. But I thank you very much for your time and your consideration. Thank you very much, the three of you. Now our next group is uh, Bill Reynolds, Steve Bott, and Susan Arntz. Um, City Administrator Reynolds. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and, and distinguished members of the committee. My name is Bill Reynolds. I'm the City Administrator for Shakopee. Uh, I'm here to talk to you about the Minnesota Riverbank Stabilization project, project that we're currently undergoing. This project combines necessary riverbank stabilization with the opportunity to preserve, protect, and honor many historic and archaeological sites along the Minnesota River. Riverbank stabilization would reduce flooding and erosion risks to critical municipal infrastructure and significant natural resources. The Minnesota River in Shakopee has eroded the riverbank considerably over the last 100 years, upwards of 100 feet near the historic Holmes Street Bridge and 40 to 50 feet in the downtown Shakopee area. Flooding events that impact Shakopee are a consequence of practices upstream as only 1% of the water that flows through the Minnesota River in this particular area actually comes from Shakopee. Due to increased flooding events, many river adjacent facilities are inundated for months, from days to months each year, including the Minnesota Valley State Trail and public parkland. Erosion 
erosion poses a specific risk to Uber Park, which is our main park in downtown Shakopee. But there are two things that are really important about this project, and the first is the existence of a sanitary sewer line that runs for about 8,800 feet along the Minnesota River at this particular uh, place. About 200 feet of that actually is inside the riverbank of the river. What this essentially means is that one major flooding event with some large tree, maybe coming from uh, an upstream community like uh, my friends in Mankato, would flow down the Minnesota River, strike and gouge out some land, rupture that pipe, and we have raw human sewage flowing down the Minnesota River and into the Mississippi. This is a critical fix. It also has cultural issues that we're concerned about. The Minnesota River Valley is home, as many of you know, to significant cultural research resources for the Dakota people and European settlers both. The project would include historic interpretation of many sites along the Minnesota River, including dozens of Dakota historical burial mounds. Thank you for con your consideration. Thank you so much. Um, next, we have Ms. Arntz. Well, since my colleague from Shakopee um, outed me here, um, I'm Susan Arntz and I serve as the city manager for the city of Mankato. Uh, I'm here to talk to you today about our water resource recovery facility. It's a, uh, essentially a water treatment facility that has some desperate needs. Uh, two years ago when we were fashioning this project, recognizing its regional significance, uh, we were talking about uh, we should, on behalf of the seven communities we serve, that we should consider uh, making a bonding ask. Um, I could probably fill the room, like many of these projects, with people who find this project important. Our facility currently sits in a uh, failed condition. Um, the piece that I'm comfortable sharing uh, publicly is that uh, through the creativity of our staff, we're custom manufacturing repair parts for the disinfection side of the equipment, taking broken pieces to local fabricators saying, can you make one like this? Because we can't get replacement parts for this equipment that was built in the 1950s. Uh, we too want to prevent sending any of our raw sewage to Shakopee um, and it, helping to uh, kind of move this project along um, certainly would help that. We do appreciate the 11 million that is currently considered in the current proposal and we look forward to working on a possibility of working uh, together to more fully fund this. Last, I wanna make sure that it's recognized that all of the partners that we serve in 2017 started the process of planning for this financially. We've increased rates on our sewer side of our utility bills 44.5% since that time. If we aren't able to fully fund this and have to try and fund the project with rates, um, we will have to increase uh, our utility bills uh, by 300%. So um, be nice to Senator Friends because he will have a larger bill um, <laughs> if we aren't able to do that. So um, we appreciate, again, the consideration of this project and recognize the importance of many of the projects you're hearing about. Thank you so much, Ms. Sarnes and Mr. Bott. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Uh, my name is Steve Bott. I'm the uh, City Administrator and Public Works Director for the City of St. Michael. And uh, many of you um, that were on the committee last year, thank you for coming out to, uh, to our facility, um, seeing uh, the issue firsthand. For those of you that weren't there, uh, you got a flyer before you uh, that shows on the bottom part uh, when we were able to use uh, reeds and reed beds that we were put in in the uh, early 2000s with the encouragement of the PCA. Uh, those reeds has since been deemed uh, by the Department of Ag and the PCA as noxious weeds. Uh, we are no longer able to use them. They essentially grew too well. And uh, now you can see the dilapidated state and uh, the world of hurt that we're in on the, north, uh, on the top of the page uh, because of that. Uh, with that uh, state designation of, uh, of those reeds as a uh, prohibitive invasive species, our plant is not able to operate properly and we need uh, your help um, and ask for it uh, with this bonding request of $5 million with the project estimate uh, for replacing those reed beds and putting in a, a new biosolids facility at a cost of 10 million with the request 
of five. Uh, the project is, is ready to go. Uh, we have plans uh, already made up, already approved. Um, we just need this uh, funding to get it across the finish line so we can complete this project. So thank you very much for your support. Thank you, Mr. Bott. Um, we'll add you to the long list of communities that have serious needs. Thank you. Um, next on our list is uh, Don Meyer, Cynthia Smith-Strack, and Lisa Fruz. And uh, Ms. Meyer? Yes. Thank you, Chair Thank you. Pappas and the committee. We appreciate your time. I am Dawn oh. Meyer. Sorry, that was the last person. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> you might have to bring the mic a little closer to you. Okay. Yeah. I am Dawn Meyer, the city administrator, and with me is Cynthia Smith-Strack, the community development director for the city of Belle Plaine. We are here today to respectfully request a $4.5 million capital allocation for a downtown rehabilitation project. The request is half of the total project cost, with the remainder being funded locally. This project was included in both the Senate and the House Capitol bills last session. The project includes construction of regional roadways, along with meeting other legislative priorities, such as not being new construction, but maintenance of infrastructure, as well as addressing accessibility and safety issues in our historic downtown. This project has to move forward with urgency for health purposes. The sewer system not only predates all engineering drawings, but we have had several sanitary sewer failures in the last year. We do have the project set to begin in April. Without capital allotment, very many micro businesses, several which are minority and women owned, along with renters living in naturally occurring affordable housing, will have impacts. And Madam Chair, members of the committee, if capital allocation is not- Could you introduce yourself, please? Sure, certainly, sorry. Cynthia Smith-Strack, Community Development Director, City of Belle Plaine. If capital allocation is not received, the city will borrow from our future by using MSA funds and delay other needed street and utility projects. We have investigated other potential financing sources, but there are no US EDA uh, opportunity zones in Scott County and no new market tax credit eligible areas. Redevelopment TIF isn't an option for this project. We have reached out to private investors and we cannot find a private sector partner to assist us. Because we're a metro area city, we lack access to uh, funding for similar sized communities in rural Minnesota, in outstate Minnesota, but because we're a metro area community and we have a small population and limited transit options, we really find it difficult to compete for metro area dollars. So thank you for walking the corridor with us in October of 2021, and we urge you to help revive a distinct place in, that's in distress. Thank you. We appreciate it. Thank you very much. Um, Appreciate you coming today. And if you, um, I don't think anyone actually ever saw the 2022 bill. I know I only saw parts of it. <laughs> so thank you for coming. Thank you. Um, uh, Mr. Franklin and uh, Ms. Murray, and uh, then we have Mr. Kruger on Zoom if he has joined us. And did Ms. Fries is not here? So, all right. Thank you. Madam Chair, thank you. Uh, I've got it on good authority that Ms. Fries is on her way. She's very close. Oh, okay. Well, we just put her on the bottom of the list. All right. I'll tread water a little bit. <laughs> Madam Chair, thank you so much for the opportunity to testify. My name is Mike Franklin. I have the privilege of serving the residents of Jordan as their mayor and the responsibility to ask for your assistance to help repair and regenerate a critical piece of state transportation infrastructure, which when complete will improve safety, efficiency, community cohesion, economic development and equity for Jordan, Scott County, and the state of Minnesota. Uh, for those of you, several of you, who were visiting Jordan uh, in the Senate bonding tour in October of 2021, you saw that this is a very busy, dangerous uh, intersection, which results in preventable fatalities every year. Uh, for that reason and others, this is why competing, completing this project is our residents' number one priority and is a top priority of the Highway 169 Coalition 
Scale, Scott County, and MnDOT. Uh, as you know, members, Highway 169 is an important corridor to the state of Minnesota as well as into our region. 60% of all of Minnesota's Fortune 500 businesses reply, rely on Highway 169 to ship freight. 50% of all Minnesota's corn, soybean, and ethanol shipments are made on that corridor. Over 30,000 vehicles a day enter this intersection at 282 and County Road 9 to access local and regional employment centers. It is critical to the ports of Savage in Senator Port's district who supports this request. This project would safely eliminate the last stoplight for 75 miles between St. Peter and Champlain. The total project cost is $44 million, and as you've seen in the flyers we've provided, uh, we have received $8 million in federal raise grant money, $7 million in TAB money, and $13 million in local commitments. Uh, and indeed, and it, thanks to congressionally directed spending by Representative Craig and Senator Klobuchar, the project will also improve pedestrian safety by completing a pedestrian tunnel and walkway that will connect the portions of our community separated by Highway 169, including the Valley Green mobile home community. Our request, members, is $9.1 million in funding for this 2024 project. Uh, the pro this body appropriated $2.5 million in 21 for design and right-of-way acquisition, and I hear that I'm almost finished. Uh, thanks in part to the investments already made, this project will be designed and shovel-ready once this final element is complete. Thank you so much for your time and consideration on this request. We know you have a lot of competing requests, and we hope that you can see fit to include this important one in your uh, final bill. Thank you. Thank you very much, and I understand Mr. McCory is going to speak next. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, my name is Perry uh, Mulcrone, and I am Mulcrone, uh, sorry. Mulcrone. I'm a staff uh, lobbyist, uh, government relations for Scott County, filling in for uh, Lisa Fries, our transportation services director. Did you want to make some comments then? Uh, uh, Lisa's here. I'm going to, the JV crew's getting out, and uh, we're going to bring in Lisa Fries. Thank oh, you. Oh, Lisa is here. All right. <laughs> Ms. Fries. My name is Lisa Fries, and I'm the Transportation Services Director. I apologize, I was stuck on 494 trying to get here. Um, I'm here today to uh, request uh, uh, that you consider funding the Merriam Junction Regional Trail. It's a regional trail in Scott County that uh, goes along the Minnesota River. Uh, it's a $23 million project. It includes four bridges, uh, trailhead parking, and over two and a half miles of paved trail. It also includes a riverbank stabilization component that is uh, a significant uh, um, cost to the project and will help improve the water quality and uh, um, uh, preserve cultural resources along the riverbank. It's about a half mile area that needs to be stabilized. Um, that particular segment each year uh, pushes about a large load of sediment down the river, so it impacts navigable waters, both on the Minnesota River and Mississippi River. So we feel like this is a, a good state investment uh, to make um, because it uh, reduces it at its source rather than having to dredge it out later. The trail itself will serve over 129,000 users when it's open, and it will open up access to the um, Louisville swamp area of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife uh, Minnesota Wildlife Refuge and um, it will also connect into downtown historic Carver in Carver County. Uh, one of the reasons, reasons the project is um, expensive is because it includes a main span river bridge over the Minnesota River. Um, we have been working and have secured federal funding for 2024 uh, for the project, so it's very imperative that we get some consideration, if it's at all possible, in this legislative session for funding to help fill our project gap, and we would appreciate anything that you could bring to, the, bring to us for this project. We know it will be a very well-used trail um, because that part of the metro area sees a lot of visitors um, for recreation and entertainment purposes. So thank you very much for your consideration. Thank you very much, and happy that you made made it to join us. We were going to put you at the end of the agenda anyway. All right. Thank you very much. For Thank you. And uh, Ms. Murray. Madam Chair and members, for the record, my name is Emily Murray with the Association of Minnesota Counties. 
AMC is a voluntary association representing all of Minnesota's 87 counties. And for the past two years, one of our top priorities has been support for a bonding bill that includes funding for transportation-related programs. Counties want to thank you for the investments included in Senate File 676 for local roads and bridges, safe routes to school, active transportation, and bus rapid transit. With the $75 million available for the local road program in 2020, 75 projects were funded. During that solicitation, MnDOT received over 400 applications totaling $344 million in requests, further supporting the need for this continued investment. As for local bridges, counties alone have identified over 500 bridges on the master bridge priority list. We appreciate the support for these two programs. We also want to thank you for including 12 million in bonds for the local road wetland replacement program. Currently, five of the 10 bank service areas are deficient, and without a cash investment in addition to the bonds, more costly mechanisms may be needed to keep projects going. Switching gears from transportation, I also want to highlight a few other programs. The MPCA Solid Waste Capital Assistance Program is important for our ability to manage problematic materials and for, di for diverting waste to recycling and composting opportunities. We appreciate the inclusion of funding for Olmstead County's project, but also want to acknowledge that there are five additional projects that have been included in the governor's recommendations the last two years that remain unfunded. Finally, AMC wants to thank you for the inclusion of $10 million for the Behavioral Health Crisis Facilities Grants. Counties receiving these dollars in the past have been able to partner with providers to stand up new facilities and fill some of the most persistent gaps in our mental health services continuum. On behalf of AMC, thank you for the opportunity to testify today and for making bonding a priority this year. Thank you, Ms. Murray. Uh, we have online now Mr. Kruger, and while he is speaking, I'd like to invite to the witness table uh, Mr. Stordahl, Ms. Markle, and Mr. Troutman. And uh, welcome, Mr. Kruger. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Jeff Krieger. I'm the Executive Director of the Minnesota Association of Townships. Uh, MAT is a member organization with 1,780 townships responsible for maintaining over 55,500 miles of road, or approximately 41% of all roads in Minnesota. I'm testifying on the Binding Bill's Local Road Improvement Program portion. In 2021, townships submitted 185 applications for LRIP which equaled $155 million in project needs. 15 of those 185 applications were funded, which left many unfunded applications. Thank you for the carve out uh, of the $6 million of LRIP funding for townships. I respectfully ask that the $6 million be a floor and not a ceiling. And again, on behalf of Matt, I appreciate uh, the time that I can testify today. Thank you very much for joining us via Zoom. Um, next, Mr. Stordahl. Good afternoon and thank you, Madam Chair and committee members. On behalf of Sand Creek Township and Scott County, I thank you for your consideration of the funding of a grade separation project along Highway 169 in Scott County. This project greatly improves driver safety along this critical corridor while helping to improve opportunities for job creation via business development and growth. The requested funds are not representative of the total project costs, but rather the last of the funding needed to bring this long awaited project to reality. These improvements are critically important as the Highway 169 corridor continues to see more and more traffic. Sand Creek Township has an industrial park in the area, meaning that more than two thirds of the vehicle traffic is large commercial vehicles and tractor trailers. At grade accesses are becoming increasingly dangerous with serious and fatal accidents occurring far too often. This project eliminates a significant number of traffic conflict points while also allowing pedestrian, non-motorized and recreational traffic to safely access the highway, or safely cross the highway, excuse me, as they try to access residential areas, businesses, and natural areas. In addition to these benefits, two developments are being considered if we can find, these, uh, find a way for these improvements to be constructed. We thank you for your consideration and support. Um, thank you, Mr. Stordahl. Um, if you can use trunk highway bonds, we're really trying to have trunk highway bonds um, used in this tra transportation committee. Um, not in this committee. If trunk highway bonds don't work for you, then, you know, then. Miss yep. um, Markle. Yeah, good afternoon, uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee. 
My name is Amy Markle and I serve as the Recreation Services Director with the City of Richfield. And I'd just like to take a minute to thank you for coming out on our tour last year uh, to Woodlake Nature Center. And thank you for um, putting this Woodlake Nature Center building project into this year's bill. Uh, the funds that would be designated to the new building would be funds that are an investment into this regional gem to ensure that it has a bright future. It would continue to prioritize equitable access and opportunity to connect thousands of students and people a year to nature through environmental education programs, school field trips, outdoor recreation that's in the heart of the Twin Cities. We'll also uh, continue to uh, provide support for the conservation of 150 urban wild acres of vital forest, marsh, and prairie that is home to endangered species and close to 200 migratory bird species. It also would help support the commitment that we have to removing the barriers that marginalized communities often face in accessing the outdoors, such as transportation and financial barriers with this facility in the heart of the city. The $24 million building, it will be sustainably built and serve as a model to the region of a sustainably built design, including elements such as geothermal and solar. Uh, the city of Richfield has a modest tax base and we have supported the facility for close to 52 years and we greatly appreciate the support of the state um, in this invaluable resources future. Thank you very much, Ms. Markle. Uh, Mr. Troutman, Council Member Troutman. Th thank you, uh, uh, Chair Pappas, and thank you to all the senators for visiting Woodlake Nature Center. And as a third generation Richfielder, I just want to tell you how grateful I am for everybody's support in what an incredible um, opportunity it is, not just for the city, but for the region. Uh, what uh, Director Markle shared about how this is uh, a location for equitable access. Um, this We serve thousands of kids in this nature center. And there are not too many places in the city environment where you have 150 acres. And so it's not just going to a park, but it's going to a nature reserve with endangered species. And just frankly, a lot of, most of the kids who come are students of, are, and children of color. And we know the barriers to most of Minnesota that doesn't feel welcoming, doesn't feel accessible. And this is more than just taking kids to a park, but it's actually engaging and immersing children in nature and just letting them know that all of Minnesota is for all of our Minnesotans. And so I wanna thank you, thank you, thank you for investing in this project and we couldn't be more pleased and grateful. Great, thank you very much. Um, great. Next up we have uh, Ms. Miles. Ms. Reimers, and Ms. Flowers. Ms. Miles. Thank you, Chair Pappas, Vice Chair Paw, and members of the committee for allowing me time before you today. My name is Cassie Miles, Executive Director of the Emerging Great River Children's Museum in downtown St. Cloud. We are seeking a $7 million capital appropriation from the state to complete the construction phase of our project. I'm also here representing the Great Greater Minnesota Children's Museum Coalition, 10 members strong, advocating on behalf of kids and families across the state. I believe you have the coalition one pager in front of you to reference if you'd like. Central Minnesota constituents have made their support of Great River Children's Museum known. We've raised over $10 million in private investments. My job is to make sure that these dollars have maximum impact, and that means acting now. Added to these private donations, your investment in this project will allow us to open our doors. We are shovel ready. Racially and economically, St. Cloud is one of the most diverse cities in the state. Together with the surrounding rural communities, there are over 80 elementary schools in our 11 county service region, schools eager for field trips to a children's museum where cross-cultural connections and multi-layered play experiences are proven to reduce the inequities between advantaged children and their disadvantaged counterparts. I also want to share how important it is to consider that learning how to learn is a skill that is fully developed by the age of three. After that time, it is a remedial effort that does not achieve the same benefit. Children's museums serve children from birth. And we see ourselves as a vital precursor to K-12 education and integral to strong mental and physical health. Of course, the benefits of children's museums go far beyond play. Museums drive economic growth and improve the quality of life in the regions that they serve. 
These factors drive the decisions of young families when they are setting down roots, seeking employment, and buying homes. These, this leads to a larger workforce pool needed in St. Cloud to support consistent growth in industries such as healthcare, finance, manufacturing, and education. I thank you for your consideration of Great River Children's Museum's $7 million request. Your decision to fund this project will result in a fully operational children's museum, the first in central Minnesota, and positively impact generations of families. Thank you for your time today. Perfect timing. Great. Thank you so much. And next we have uh, Ms. Reimers. Good afternoon. Uh, Sherry Reimers with the Indah Young Center, Executive Director. I think you have to lead a little closer. Yeah. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Pappas, Vice Chair Pa, and Senator Housley, my senator, uh, members of the Capital Investment Committee. I humbly and graciously thank you for including our organization in this bill and to share precious moments of your time to speak before you today. As I thought about sharing with you today, it struck me that I sit before you on the very day that marks the 40th anniversary of the founding grandmothers and grandfathers they signed our 501c3 incorporation papers, creating Ain Da Young, meaning our home in Ojibwe. The Ain Da Young Center was founded in 1983 in response to the disproportionate number of youth in, in county out of home placement and homeless youth across our American Indian uh, community. Today it operates three facilities in St. Paul and its mission is to provide a healing place within the community for American Indian youth and families to thrive in safety and wholeness. We, only, we, have only, we have the only emergency shelter in the East Metro that provides a safe space for children being referred through Ramsey and surrounding counties for our community's most vulnerable children in need of protective supervision and homeless youth seeking a safe place of refuge. Our organization not, not only serves countless American Indian youth, but all youth regardless of gender, race, and ethnicity. Our request has raised 300,000 to date of the 2.2 million, or of the 2.5 million needed to repair our shelter. The small request of 2.2 million addresses the most urgent capital needs of our emergency shelter serving ages 5 through 17 and our youth lodge serving ages 16 through 21. Both buildings are more than 100 years old. These buildings are more than a shelter. These buildings are home for the most vulnerable youth. It provides a safe, welcoming environment for environment that matches our mission for each and every young person coming through our door. I want to take a few moments to highlight that walk, the Wakan TP and Indal Young Center is part of a much larger vision and request. In your packets, you will have a document highlighting the Urban Indigenous Legacy Initiative of 16 renowned American Indian nonprofit organizations in the Twin Cities and Minnesota landscape, serving over 10,000 citizens across the state of Minnesota that have provided our communities with services focused on issues ranging from healthcare to housing, workforce development to child care for more than four decades, serving underserved communities seeking critical support in state funding to, to, to construct or rehab their buildings that will allow us to, to address the disparities by expanding services, creating safe, empowering experiences for those we serve moving forward to transform our community for generations to come. Again, it is an honor to speak before you today, and I thank you for your wisdom and support in joining our community and seeing Inda Young Center and our Yuli projects forward. Miigwech, and thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Streamers. Uh, next, Ms. Flowers. Good afternoon, Chair Pappas and members of the committee. Thank you, Senator Zhang. We appreciate you serving as chief author and proud to be located in your district. And special thanks to Senator Housley for being chief author last session, for continuing as author this session, and for being a long-standing champion of the work to serve your district. My name is Janita Flowers, a proud board member of Tubman. I'm a business owner and a survivor of domestic violence who once used Tubman services. I appreciate this opportunity to share more about our request for $3,388,300 as part of the Capital Investment Bill, SF-677. Each year, Tubman serves nearly 20,000 youth, adults, and families who have experienced relationship violence, sex trafficking, homelessness, addiction, mental health challenges, and other forms of trauma. We provide a con comprehensive continuum of services, including shelter and housing, legal 
and mental and chemical health support, youth programs, and more. All of Tubman's programs are designed with, by, and for survivors using a racial equity lens. The public benefits of this project are community safety, accessibility, and economic security. Harriet Tubman Center East is a 58-year-old, 110,000 square foot, historically significant building we own and operate in Maplewood. To expand programs to serve a growing number of clients, Tubman must invest in capital investments. We have a proven track record of ethical and sound stewardship of resources and have already raised $3.2 million in the private sector to fund other aspects of the larger project. These state capital investment funds will allow us to add a public elevator to assure universal accessibility to critical program services for people with disabilities, as well as safety and confidentiality for all our facility users, especially victim survivors in our on-site shelter and housing programs. <coughs> also replace part of our roof, upgrade the electrical system and make additional energy efficiency improvements, replace windows for improved safety and increased ventilation, and complete necessary fire sprinkling. I thank you for your time, and I welcome any questions you may have. Thank you very much. Um, next, we have um, uh, Ms. Cobb, Mr. Fredson, and Ms. Merce. Welcome, Ms. Cobb. Good to see you. Good afternoon. Chair Pappas and members, my name is Adaro Reiser Cobb, and I am the Chief Operating Officer at Keystone Community Services. We are here in support of the SF-677, which provides $2.3 million from the state to Keystone Community Services for a 20,000-square-foot community food site that will support 50,000 people with healthy food. Keystone is the largest food shelf in the East Metro. The number of new participants nearly tripled from 2022 compared to 2021. The total number of visits that have increased 80% within that year. This new community food site will function like a community center on University Avenue with more room to offer community programming as well as a larger food market area and a large warehouse to store more food and other donated household items. A garage on site will house our two food mobiles. At the new site, we'll be able to double the amount of food from two million pounds to four million pounds per year we can provide for our community, including household items that we don't have room for now, supporting more people with more food. This new site will re revitalize a section of University Avenue near the Fairview um, light rail station. We would like to thank Senator Pappas and Senator Housley for supporting our project over the years. We have raised $8.1 million of the $10.7 million. We are shovel ready. The, the passage of this bill will help us start construction immediately. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Cobb. Mr. Fredson. Thank you, Chair Pappas, Ranking Member Housley, and members of the committee. My name is Chris Fredson. I'm the Director of Public Affairs for Layuna, Minnesota and North Dakota. We're proud to represent more than 13,000 skilled construction laborers who build our transportation, water, energy, and building infrastructure in communities across Minnesota. We want to thank all of you for your work over the last few years in support of these important local jobs and projects that create family supporting careers for our members. As you know, 2022 was a bonding year and the legislature failed to pass a bonding bill. Minnesotans deserve better. We ask you to pass a large construction jobs bill early in the 2023 legislative session. Minnesota's crumbling infrastructure is an increasing threat to our health, safety, and economic prosperity. Now is the time to make our roads, bridges, transit, and water systems safer. We need to fix, catch up, and keep up our infrastructure. And passing a large capital investment bill will help us do that. As you may know, we recently doubled the size of our training center in Lionel Lakes to help meet the need for skilled construction laborers. Now we need our state leaders to do our part. We urge you to come together and get the job done. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fredson. And I just want to comment that 
every year is a bonding year. Thank you. And Ms. Merce. Thank you. My name is Catherine Mears, and I am the Executive Director of Avenues for Homeless Youth. We support youth experiencing homelessness with shelters in Minneapolis and Brooklyn Park. Chair Pappas, members of the committee, thank you for including $2,073,000 for Avenues in the DE amendment to Senate File 677 and for the opportunity to speak today. And a special thank you to Senator Dibble for always championing youth experiencing homelessness. Minnesota is facing an unsheltered homelessness crisis. An estimated 13,300 youth alone will experience homelessness in Minnesota this year. Avenues works every day to address this crisis, but shelter capacity in the metro and statewide is not even close enough to meet the need. When provided developmentally appropriate supports, youth can successfully move into stable housing and thrive as young adults. Avenues will build a new home for our shelter and transitional housing program in Minneapolis. Our current Minneapolis building was built in 1934. The space is crowded and does not adequately meet youth's needs. We know that a building's design and space is imperative to the safety, security, and well-being of our youth, what they need during their stays with us. The new building will also allow us to grow our programming to fill the gap left by, sure, by current shelter capacity. You have a information, more information about our project in your packets. Financing shelter capital projects is difficult. There are multiple funding options for shelter capital, but they are minimal, and we have to braid multiple funding streams of small amounts over the course of multi-year campaigns. Please take this opportunity to invest in this critical infrastructure that saves lives. If we wait, youth will continue to couch hop, live on the streets, and stay in abusive situations in order to find housing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, the three of you. I'd like to invite Molly Jansen. And Uh, Ms. Jansen is the last person on my list, but if there's anyone else in the room, since we have some extra time, that would also like to testify, I'm certainly willing to hear your, testif your testimony after Ms. Jansen. Thank you, Chair Pappas. Um, good afternoon to the committee. My name is Molly Jansen, and I am Government Relations Specialist with the Nature Conservancy in Minnesota. The Nature Conservancy is a nonpartisan science-based organization that works to preserve the lands and waters on which all life depends so that people and nature can thrive. Thank you for the opportunity to comment today on the DE amendment to Senate File 676. We especially want to thank Chair Pappas and the committee for proposed investments in reforestation, community tree planting, and upgrades to the um, state forest nursery. These investments will backfill reforestation needs and support the planting of new trees in forests and communities around the state. We also thank the committee for the proposed appropriation for the Conservation Reserve Enhancement Program, or CREP, which will complete the state's financial matching agreement with the USDA. As the committee considers a new bonding bill in 2023, we encourage the committee to consider investments in natural climate solutions that go above and beyond those proposed today in the DE amendment to, how, to Senate File 676. Science tells us that natural climate solutions, which can include tree planting, soil health practices, and strategic land protection, are a key pathway to meeting the state's carbon sequestration goals and also help to preserve biodiversity and protect our state's water, working forests, and grasslands. Natural climate solutions are bipartisan and widely supported by Minnesotans. So now more than ever, the state has an opportunity to invest and make considerable investments in natural climate solutions so that future generations can enjoy our state's resources. Thank you so much for the committee's work and the opportunity to testify today. Great, thank you very much. Um, members, there is more written testimony in your packets of people who couldn't make it today, so be sure to take a look at that. Um, any, is there anyone else in the audience who wanted to testify? I guess I could have given everyone two and a half minutes. To, yeah. the, um, I just wanted to remind members that 
um, Senator Friends and Senator Nelson, I just wanted to remind the members that on Tuesday is when um, we're going to be open for amendments and hopefully pass the bill on to the Finance Committee. And on that note, I was wondering if uh, Senator Housley has any updates for us. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, actually, I'm, I'm glad you tossed it to me because I was going to ask you. Do you think there is any way that maybe next week we could have a hearing um, on some of these other projects? I've, like you know, we're getting bombarded and there are a lot of great projects that, uh, uh, there's four new members of the committee, five, including Rasmussen, who wasn't on the, the Capital Investment Committee last year in the Senate. Um, and we haven't, I haven't toured any of these projects. And so I'm just wondering, is there any day next week that maybe we could have some of these other folks come in and, and talk to us about the projects that they have? Senator Housley, you're reading my mind. I was going to talk to you about that, that I think we have something scheduled on Thursday, but the following week, we do intend to start hearing projects. Anybody who has submitted a hearing request, and I actually did want to consult with you about that, about in what order or who you would like to hear from, but we definitely want to hear from your members and our members who were not included in the first bill. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. That would, that would be great. I'll, I'll let them know, and then I'll talk to you offline. Good, we're looking through all the projects. Great, we are. Any other comments from anyone? Questions? All right, then everyone have a great Friday and a great weekend. Thank you, the committee is adjourned.